Let it. Let it resound. Let it resound. like this part right here. Come on. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the something to it. Just encourage you. We're going to take you to church later. Let's go! To all my brothers out there. To all my sisters in the struggle. Till that day! Welcome, and thank you for attending the 2021 Black History Program here at Crossroads Presbyterian Church. Today we'll be highlighting voices of our past, present, and future. Men and women who have made a difference in our country through their sacrifice and commitments. Our youth and adults will use their voices to creatively express and represent our history, present and future leaders, influencers, through the spoken word, music, and visual arts. Sit back, relax, and enjoy our program as we lift every voice. Black history is significant to all racial groups in our beloved country because it's, history, it's, because it's a story of a people that have been marginalized and succeeded against the odds. The Dorsey siblings would now share their thoughts regarding the importance of this annual celebration. Of civilization. 
Negro History Week officially became Black History Month in 1976. Since 1976, every U.S. president had endorsed the annual celebration of Black History Month. Black History Month is important because it is a month in which we celebrate the lives and contributions of significant historical and contemporary black leaders. Black History Month is not just for those individuals who made it into our history books. Since our coming to this land, Negro spirituals have vocalized and symbolized the forced servitude and hardship slaves from Africa endured in this land. They were, they were and still are an expression of Christian values which shaped the experiences of our people since being forcibly brought to this country. Today, you will hear and experience Negro spirituals through our program, beginning with O Freedom as sung by a third grader, Asia Lewis. Asia, and I'm nine years old. I will be singing a Negro spiritual a song called Oh Freedom. Very 
voices from our past and present. This segment will highlight voices from our rich history and our current day accomplishments. First up, we will have a portrait of the great poet Phyllis Wheatley as performed by a fourth grader, Nora Davis, followed by Marquito Davis. He will do a poem raised by my mother. He's on the faculty at Reed Ann High School. Enjoy. Seventeen fifty-three. I was born in West Africa. I was kidnapped at a pond this big dark ship where I got my first name. Little did I know I was going to be enslaved. My master John Wheatley gave me his last name. I began to scribble on floors and walls. Susanna Wheatley saw I was different than them all. I wrote my first poem at the age of 13. I then went on to become the first African woman poet to be. Take a listen to one of my pieces. Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land. Taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a Savior too. Once our redemption, neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with the scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes, black as cane, may be refined and join the angelic train. I am the sweet. Hi, I'm Marquino Davis. Um, I'm a teacher in this community at Reed Ann High School. I teach English, and uh, I want to share some history, some thoughts that I had about black history with you. Um, this poem is about uh, black women in history and how they remind me of my mothers, and they all taught me lessons just like my mom did. Um, I hope you like it. It's called, I Was Raised by Many Mothers. Although I am assigned a biological mother, I was raised by many mothers. My mother is Mary McLeod Bethune. She was an educator. She founded the Educational Institute for Girls in 1904. She taught me that education was the key to opening many doors of opportunity. My mother is Madam C.J. Walker. She was an entrepreneur. She created hair care solutions and remedies with black women in mind. She taught me that if you have a dream, it's okay to, re to aim for them when given the opportunity. My mother was Mae Jemison. She was an astronaut. She was the first woman admitted into the astronaut training program in 1987. She taught me to aim for the moon when chasing your dreams. And if you miss, at least you will land amongst the stars. My mother is Shirley Chisholm. She was the first black woman elected to Congress in 1968. She also became the first black person to run for president. She taught me that it's okay to be the only lone wolf in a room full of sheep. My biological mother is Tina Davis. She is a barber. She struggled to provide for us, but like magic, the necessities would always appear. She taught me that love is endless and time is limited, so remember your past and apply those lessons to the path that is your future. I was raised by my mothers. Thank you. We were all raised by mothers and raised by a village. Great poem, sir. Really enjoyed that. Gospel music has been an essential force in the advancement of African Americans. It originated when Africans began to fuse traditional African sounds with, Chris, with Christian lyrics. Gospel music roots are steeped in the spiritual music, in the spiritual music sung by slaves. I invite you to listen to the sounds of this familiar gospel song, When the Saints Go Marching In, performed by the Inkabi twins, Joseph and Joel 
and their sister, college sister, Jasmine. That will be followed by uh, a presentation by Trinity Traplin and Zoe Powell. Hello, my name is Trinity. I love school, but I hate math. It's okay, because statistics tell us that boys outscore girls on math tests 6 to 1. I, too, was a believer that math was not a subject that most girls were good at, until I learned about Mrs. Katherine Johnson, one of the greatest female mathematicians in history. Katherine Johnson was born in 1918 in West Virginia. As a kid, she loved school, especially math. Her favorite thing to do was count. She counted everything in sight. In fact, she excelled so quickly that she graduated high school at 10 years old. Can you believe that? At 15, she began college and took classes that will help her become a mathematician. A mathematician is a math expert who can solve very difficult problems. For example, geometry where lines and shapes are used. After graduating, college at 18, Catherine became a teacher, later got married, and became a mother. When Catherine was 34 years old, she heard that NACA, now NASA, was hiring African American women to solve very difficult math problems. These women were called computers. Catherine didn't get the job the first time she applied, but she never gave up. A year later, she got the job. She worked hard, asked a lot of questions, and eventually she started going to meetings where only men had trained. She began working on special projects where she had excelled. In 1962, the United States decided to send people to the moon, and that would take a lot of work. So NASA created large teams to research problems and to solve problems they may encounter. Catherine studied how to use geometry for space travel. She figured out the paths for spacecraft to orbit Earth and land on the moon. NASA used Catherine's math and it worked. NASA sent astronauts into orbit around Earth. Later, her math sin helped send astronauts to the moon and back. NASA could never have done these things without Catherine Johnson and her love for math. Katherine Johnson worked for NASA more than 30 years and she retired in 1986. During retirement, she enjoyed traveling, spending time with her friends and family. She encouraged kids to learn more and more about math and science and to never ever give up on their dreams. Sadly, she died on February 24, 2020. She was 101 years old. If you are interested in learning more about Katherine Johnson's life, watch the movie Hidden Figures. In closing, I would like to leave you with a quote by William Paul Thurston. Mathematics is not about numbers, equations, computation, or algorithms. It's about understanding. Thank you.
Douglas was born on December 31st, 1995, as Gabrielle Christina Victoria Douglas in Virginia Beach, Virginia. She was born with a rare blood disease that caused her to lose weight every day. She has one brother and two sisters. Age three, she started practicing gymnastics with her sister. She competed in several competitions before going to the U.S. Summer Olympics in London at the age of 16. She, along with the members of the women's gymnastics team, took home the gold medal. She went. She went on to compete in the individual all around and became the first African American to win gold in both the ind individual all around and team competitions at the same Olympics. She returned to the Olympics in 2016, helping the team win gold again. She wrote the book, Grace, Gold, and Glory, about her leap of faith. Several other books have been written about her, as well as a movie in 2014 called The Gabby Douglas Story.
That is a great song from our civil rights era. And I do pray that one day we will not have to sing that song about overcoming. Our history is rich with individuals which, which have achieved phenomenal accomplishments as the first African American to do something in their field. Morris Patterson will highlight two such American firsts. His father, Judge Cecil Patterson, a friend of mine and a friend of this church, and Joc Jocelyn Dorsey, the first black female anchor in Atlanta. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, two ex individuals I'm going to speak about. Uh, I have a very personal connection to, of course, you know, my father and Jocelyn, who is a dear friend, a mentor, and uh, I actually worked with her for several years. So uh, we'll start off with my father behind us, all right? My dad, I'm going to say my dad, <laughs> Judge Cecil Patterson, uh, is a 1971 graduate of Arizona State Law School, okay? Uh, let me start first. He's saying he's a, he graduated from Hampton University in Virginia in 1963. Now, the story is he didn't have enough money to pay for law school, so he enlisted in the United States Air Force. He served a five-year stint in the Air Force with uh, assignments in Labrador, Canada, and Sioux City, Iowa, okay? His, uh, duties were to track Soviet airplanes. So after he, after he left the Air Force, he went to Arizona State Law School, graduated in 1971. And from there, he was an attorney, he represented the Phoenix Urban League until 19, and became a public defender in the uh, Maricopa County, uh, in, in Maricopa County. And in 1980, he was appointed by then Governor Bruce Babbitt to sit on the Superior Court in Maricopa County. He was the first uh, African American to sit on a Superior Court in Arizona. Uh, now, some things that are not, uh, some things that, that you know, are, are not bullet points, but I'd just like to say that his involvement with the community was very strong. The late, Gen the late Senator John McCain, who was a congressman at, at that time, actually reached out to my father. He wanted him to be a bridge. He wanted, to, he wanted him to be a bridge to the uh, black and brown communities in Arizona. Uh, from then, they had a very strong friendship that lasted all the way up until uh, Senator McCain passed away. Okay? In 1996, Governor Fife Symington appointed my father to the Arizona State Court of Appeals. He was yet another, uh, yet again, he was the first African American man, first African American to sit on, on the bench on the Court of Appeals. He stayed on the Court of Appeals until his retirement in 2006. And in 2017, the Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law at Arizona State established an endowment, the Honorable Cecil B. Patterson Scholarship Fund, Scholarship Endowment, in his name, of course. And gave and, and as a tribute to his uh, his service he also was uh, they also named a room after him at the Bues Center of Law in downtown Phoenix now we move to uh, Jocelyn Dorsey very dear friend of mine mentor she is an, a graduate of the Ohio State University uh, her first job out of college was a photographer and reporter for the Cincinnati Herald newspaper. She made her transition into television in 1972 working at WKRC-TV, also in Cincinnati. She stayed there for a year before coming to Atlanta and before accepting a position at WSB-TV here in Atlanta as a reporter and anchor. She was the first, a lot of people think that Monica Pearson, Monica Kaufman Pearson was the first black anchor in the Atlanta television market. Not true. It was Jocelyn Dorsey. Jocelyn stayed, Jocelyn remained an anchor, assignment editor, producer, and reporter for 10 years before establishing in 1983 the community, becoming direct, excuse me, 
becoming director of editorials and public affairs and creating the public affairs department at WSB TV. And till this day, WSB TV had one of the longest and strongest community affairs departments. Jocelyn retired from WSB TV after 45 years of service in 2018. But also, let me just say how much Jocelyn means to me. I worked in Jocelyn's department for four years, okay, as a post-production post editor and a director. Jocelyn had a, an internship program set up for majority uh, African-American young ladies, all right? She was a mentor to many, many people in that station. She is an Atlanta icon uh, who still serves the community to this day. So I celebrate Jocelyn and my father, two, two, two African-American first. We will now have that great dance routine performed again because the first time when we were enjoying it, uh, one of the dancers encountered some uh, medical issues and she did not want uh, that presentation to be the final presentation. So here's that fantastic dance routine again. Enjoy Matched Up. With my face turned to the sun Weight on my shoulders A bullet in my gun Oh, I got eyes in the back of my head Just in case I have to run I can when I can while I can for my people While the clouds roll back and the stars fill the night That's when I'm gonna stand up Take my people with me Together we are going to a brand new home Far across the river Can you hear freedom calling? Keep on keeping on I can feel it in my bones Early in the morning Before the sun begins to shine Separating lines I'm waiting through the mighty waters You know I gotta make a mind And I don't mind if I lose any blood On the way to salvation And I'll fight with the strength That I got until I die so I'm gonna stand up, take my people with me Together we are going to a brand new home Far across the river, can you hear freedom calling? Calling me to answer, gonna keep on keeping on Be hard. 
Can you hear freedom calling, calling me to answer? Gonna keep on keeping on. I'm gonna stay. That was excellent, as I said. It was excellent the first time. It's really great that time, too. Thank you. Now, new voices for a new generation. Yes, there are great young African Americans who are forging their paths amongst us here in Atlanta. Lowry. These men and women, despite daily obstacles, refuse to retreat in the face of political economic or racial challenges. Sandy Lewis and her team will highlight a few of these up-and-coming young leaders here in our midst. reform, unauthorized immigrants, and climate change. Zoe Bambara, 19, a freshman at Morris Brown College. She was highly affected by the deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Harbery, and Breonna Taylor. She posed a question to herself. Where was the conversation about Breonna Taylor? At this point, she decided to organize a march on May 29th of what would become Atlanta's first and largest Black Lives Matter protest. Zoe was recognized by the Georgia First Amendment Foundation for leveraging her rights peaceably to assemble. Teo Swin, 35 years old. He directs the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for nonviolent social changes, nonviolent education and training efforts. He started an organization called Millennial Civil Rights Movement, and his job was to advocate for modernized human and civil rights. He feels that it is more important than ever to encourage the next generation of millennials to take an active role in shaping the future of our country. The Millennial Civil Rights Movement was and is actively campa campaigning and working with voter registration for the Democratic senatorial candidates. It's time to boldly confront division, racism, and injustice. Demetra Luster, 28, is known as the advocate in the city of Atlanta. She constantly receives phone calls from people who need her help while facing serious issues. Hosea Williams was her mentor as she learned about the civil rights movement. His aggressive style on issues in the community was very clear. He marched and spoke up when things were not right. It was that spirit that drove her to speak up. 
During a post-college internship in the community health, the organization she worked for often disregarded the circumstances of the West Atlanta family participating in the program. If you see something, say something, then do something when injustice occurs. She pushes the organization to be more mindful of participant experiences. Demetra worked in the neighborhood of Mechanicsville, Pittsburgh, and Peoplestown. In 2017, she founded the grassroots organization, The Urban Advocate. Recently, her work focused, focused on gun violence prevention, trauma response, and reclaiming the streets. With the death of Rashad Brooks in Peoplestown, she has worked hard to get police to adopt a community policing program, prohibit the issue of chokehold, and eliminate qualified immunity for officers. The Mecha, the advocate, continues. James Major Woodall, 26, is the youngest person to be the president of the Georgia chapter of NAACP. While a student of Georgia Southern, he laid a protest march after the death of Eric Gardner, who was killed by police. Say their names, Philando Castile, Michael Brown, Alton Sterling, Bolton Jean, and a child, Tamir Rice, were all killed by police. With so many being killed by police, Woodall wanted to respond to the challenges facing this generation. Since his election as president of the Georgia chapter of the NAACP, He's been leading marches against racial injustice, lobbying elected officials, and speaking out about the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on the black community. James Woodall is a new voice for a new generation with a new vision for the new age. He is a renaissance to the kind of work our ancestors were committed. It is a resurrection. And now, a phenomenal black woman, Stacy. Yvonne Abrams, American politician, lawyer, voting rights activist, and author who served in the House of Representatives and became the minority leader from 2011 to 2017. A graduate from Spelman College, Yale Law School, and the LBJ School of Public Affairs, Stacy earned wide praise for her successful voting rights efforts in Georgia. She was a driving force behind President Biden's presidential win and turning Georgia blue. She founded the Fair Rights Initiative in 2018, adding more than 800,000 new names to the electoral rolls. After being defeated by an opponent she dubbed the architect of voter suppression, and only just by 55,000 votes, she dedicated herself to ensuring that history would not repeat itself in what was once the heartland of slavery and segregation, but also the birthplace of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Stacey Abrams stated, we are required to find solutions to our most intractable problems and to use our skills to expand opportunity for all. Thank you, Stacy, for a job well done. Thank you for being committed to democracy itself. Teach the babies. Teach the children. Teach the children. Teach the babies. Teach the children. Teach the babies. Everyone who's coming out.
considering we have members of our congregation from roughly 20 plus countries, it's not surprising that we have such diverse artwork within our homes. Thank you for donating, for sharing your art with us. Now, Ben Banneker, a free, self-taught African-American mathematician, astronomer, almanac author, and farmer. At age 15, he took over the family farm and created an irrigation system to control the flow of water to the crops. In the 1750s, he invented the first clock in America. It was this invention that put his talents on display for the country. Responsible for surveying of territory for construction of the nation's capital in 1791 after the lead architect quit. Authored commercially successful series of almanacs, corresponded with Thomas and Jefferson, drafter of the United States Declaration of Racial Equality. Martin Delaney, abolitionist, journalist, physician, writer, and arguably the first proponent of black nationalism. He led the vigilance committee that helped relocate fugitive slaves. He joined integrated militia to help defend the black community against white mob attacks. Founded the Mystery, the first African-American newspaper published west of the Allegheny Mountains. One of three first black men to enroll in Harvard Medical College in 1850 commissioned as a major and first African-American field officer in the United States Army during the Civil War. Nat Turner, enslaved African-American who led a rebellion of slaves and free blacks, nicknamed the Prophet. He was a Christian preacher that traveled from plantation to plantation, ministering to the so-called slaves about the Word of God. He said God spoke to him and told him to lead a revolt and to kill his oppressors. He used his preaching network to build his rebellion for freedom. His fight for freedom killed 55 white supremacists, hanged after being judged and sentenced to death. Marcus Garvey, Jamaican political leader, publisher, journalist, entrepreneur, orator, and proponent of the Pan-Africanism movement. Founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League in 1914. At its height, the organization had over 5 million paid members worldwide. The African Diaspora Organization of its time. The largest African Diaspora Organization of its time. In 1919, established the Negro Factories Corporation and founded the Black Star Shipping and Passenger Line, which promoted the return of African diaspora to, the, to their ancestral lands. Matthew Henson. He was the first African-American Arctic explorer, recognized as the first person to reach the North Pole in 1909 recorded his Arctic memoirs, A Negro Explorer at the North Pole, in 1912, and in 1937 became the first African American accepted into the exclusive International Explorers Club due to his achievement. He made six voyages and spent a total of 18 years in expeditions. At the age of 70, received an award from the United States Navy and a gold medal from the Chicago Geographic Society. and social protest campaign against the policy of racial segregation within the public transit system of Montgomery lasted 381 days. Prominent figures in the civil rights movement participated in the boycott. For example, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, and Rosa Parks, they all demanded that Montgomery busing segregation laws be eliminated. They provided economic boycotts by the African-American population 
and that led to great results in the battle for civil rights. As the racial segregation of the public transit system crumbled under the financial losses, the companies folded. But we should have formed and supported our own companies. Despite this proof, the collective African American efforts to economically boycott seem to have stagnated. We wish the energy and effort would one day find a rebirth. Claudette Colvin was a pioneer of the civil rights movement. Nine months before Rosa Parks on March 2, 1955, when she was only 15 years old, she refused to move from her seat on a Montgomery-bound segregated bus. She had paid the fare and felt it was her constitutional right to board the bus. She was dragged off the bus, handcuffed, and taken to an adult jail. Remember, she was only 15. Colvin is not a much celebrated figure in the, the African-American civil rights movement. Many believe that this is because she was perceived to be darker tone and pregnant. Colvin had a child born out of wedlock at the age of 16. On February 1st, 1956, Claudette served as a star witness alongside four other plaintiffs in the Browder v. Gale case. This landmark federal case chaired by a three-judge panel ended in the history ended the history of segregation on public transportation in Alabama and other states in America. The 
Now, we will end our program. We're going to end our program with the selection of How I Got Over It. We chose that selection by the Vocal Works Gospel Choir intentionally. It was intentionally chosen to reflect that black history or African American history is really American history. Thanks for joining us today. Enjoy how I got over.